Randy Kay here. We all go through struggles at times, and I want to share with you through stories and insights and interviews with others how much God loves you. He loves you immensely, and that's what I hope you will hear through our interviews and what we have to share with you. Thanks for staying tuned. Here we go. Welcome to this episode of Revelations from Heaven. My guest today, Dana Brown, she was poisoned to death. Then she, when she died, she went to heaven. She went to heaven actually as a child. We'll talk about why that happened in her case. Then she traveled with Jesus. What she saw in heaven was the full spectrum of the Bible. She was actually placed in what appeared to be the Garden of Eden. So she'll explain all of these experiences, which are absolutely phenomenal and will blow our minds. So uh, Dana, it is great to be with you today. Oh, thanks for having me. Well, Dana, let's start now for, uh, you had an experience, you were living uh, in a kind of the middle part of uh, California in Bakersfield, you moved westward uh, to the coast in Southern California. Uh, mm -hmm. You moved in at the invitation of some guests mm -hmm. and then something began to happen and uh, it was surprising to say the least. Yeah. Um, so I had an invitation to move down to Capistrano Beach, which is um, right next to Dana Point. And um, after I moved into this apartment, I became extremely ill to the point where I couldn't get out of bed. And I kept going to the hospital and they couldn't figure out what was happening. So I just thought, well, maybe, you know, you're sick with some autoimmune disease that they haven't discovered yet or something. Things like this happen. It's, you know, I wouldn't say it's common, but it happens, you know, where people are mysteriously ill. And I definitely was not thinking somebody was trying to hurt me at the time. That uh, occurred to me later on. And when I confronted the person two days later, I got into my vehicle the seat was moved so far back that I couldn't drive. So I physically had to move my seat forward. And then I would say within minutes, my neck became so sore and I started feeling really, really ill. And I went home right away. That's how bad I felt. And I thought, I'm just going to go and lie down because I had this headache. And when I, lied, when I went to lie down, I knew I was going to die. I just knew it. And I thought, well, if I'm going to die, let's just get it over with. And I died. All of a sudden I was in the ground and there were roots and it was so interesting. And Jesus was carrying me over his shoulder. Um, and he had the softest, whitest robes and he had a light in one hand and a staff in the other. We journeyed through the earth for what seemed just like a moment. And then I was standing on a plateau the adversary or Satan was on my right side. He's made a blue flame, like the hottest part of the fire. And Yeshua was on my left. Praise God. I was on his right. And the adversary was shaking his finger, condemning me. And I looked over and there was a pit. I'm fairly sure that was hell, although I didn't see it. And, um, I looked up and there was Abraham and I knew he was Abraham who sat at a desk. He has a really long beard. He asked the cherubim, which is like a little hummingbird. It was so small to go get a scroll. And the scroll was so teeny tiny. It could fit in his hands, the cherubim. But when he unraveled this scroll, it went down his desk along the, along the plateau and then down this pit. And I, I thought, wow, those are all the words I've ever said. My heart was so heavy because I'm quite chatty. And I thought I didn't mean all the things I've ever said. You know, I had a lot of regret about that. And then um, as Satan was condemning me and shaking his finger and pointing to that pit, although I couldn't hear him, but it was very obvious that he was definitely condemning me. Um, Yeshua, all he did was he lifted his head up and said I was his. And then boom, we were right in heaven. I could see the streets were really paved of gold, but like handmade bricks, not like something you'd see in a movie. And there were flags lining the streets. And then people were on both sides clapping and cheering. And I thought, wow, this is so lovely. I felt like I was in a parade. Mm 
But then my view panned out and I could see myself with Jesus. And I knew they were all clapping for him because he had rescued me and brought me home. They weren't clapping for me. (laughs) Mm. Um, But that gave me revelation at that very moment that I had taken credit for all the good works that he had done in my life. And I remember thinking he truly has given us every, every blessing that's in our life. Like even the fact that we can breathe Mm -hmm. is because of God's grace. So then after we were walking in the streets, all of a sudden there was, we were in like um, a different place. I I don't know what that was. He didn't tell me, but it was definitely a different place where it was just him and I, and I saw a pool of water and there was a waterfall and there were two women in there and they were splashing themselves with this water and they were crying. And I said, what are they doing? And I, I was quite young though. I was only like eight. I imagine that was my spiritual age. I didn't ask why I was that young, but I was very young. And, um, I said, what are they? Had you been a believer for, in Christ as your savior for eight years or? Yes. Yes. Ah. So that's the only thing that I could think of is that was my spiritual age, which is very interesting. Um, yeah, that's, but who knows, you know? Um, So the women were in a pool of water. They were crying. They're confessing. And I said, what are they doing? And he said, they're confessing. And I said, why? He said, sin acts like a wedge between us and God. And we confess, boom, we come right back together. That's why when we're little, we feel so good. But when we get older, not so much, you know? And um, then he showed me the whole Bible was true, cover to cover, like downloaded it in my mind super fast from Revelation all the way to Genesis. The last thing I remember seeing was Eve biting into this apple and a worm came out. And I thought, whoa, Satan was cursed to be a worm, the lowest of things that will eat dust all the days of its life. Wow. That was so interesting for me. And he asked me if I had any questions. And I said, no, because prior to me passing, I did. I had questions if the whole Bible was true because it had been translated in different languages. It was quite old, you know, political influences, what have you. So you really and, didn't believe in the accuracy of the Bible up to the point where you actually were, and Jesus was essentially reading it to you at this point. Yeah, I definitely, I just had my, I just had my questions. I mean, I believe that Jesus Christ was the son of God and then possibly some of it could be true or the majority of it could be true. But he said, no, cover to cover, every single word in there is true. And I was like, wow, you know, and that's when he asked me, do you have any questions? And I said, no, like, I believe you. (laughs) You can tell me it's all truth and it's all true. And then after that, um, I could see what I was wearing. I was wearing white robes and they were embroidered with gold filigree. They were little flowers everywhere. I had cords in my sleeves and my breastplate, which were made of three different kinds of metals. They were gold, white gold, and like a silver, three different colors are so pretty. And there were elders around me and they said, who is she? Okay. Well, later when I read in the Bible, that's right out of tribulations so for sure we're we're in the time and this was i believe six years ago when i died so we're definitely in it and then i i uh i so, talked to my dana oh. i'm sorry for no, so the lord was revealing to you mm-hmm. the period of tribulation giving you kind of a prophetic uh view of tri- the tribulation with the elders there can you kind of uh, elaborate on that a bit. What was he showing you in terms of the elders being around you? Just that they were just elders around me and they said, who is she? That's, and I was wearing white robes and he showed me what they look like. Um, but yeah, that was, that was it. And then I spoke to my aunt Anita, who's a nun and, um, she was still wearing her same, her same outfit. It was so lovely. It was this light silver blue color. It was really pretty, not quite a gray, but it was lovely. And I said, what did I do to get here? I grew up in a Catholic church and, um, it's, it's really, it's really based on like works, you know, you have to, cause I, well, this is what happened. I said, what did I do to get here? She said, nothing. You, you're not good. Only God is good. Every single time you did something good, that was God shining through you. And I remember thinking, but I tried so hard to be a good person. 
it was so, it's still really hard for me to grasp God's unconditional love, just Mm -hmm. how it's, it's literally a gift. It's not something we earn. It's not something we can work for. You know, I mean, we should definitely be obedient to the will of God in our life and listen to the Holy Spirit. But, um, yeah, it wasn't by anything that I had done for sure. And, um, I remember regretting not loving people more at that point. And, um, then boom, I was back here. I was just right back here and I was still sick, which was hard for me because I've heard of other people that have passed and they were healed. And, you know, I was like wondering, you know, was, was God upset with me? Um, why would he put me back here? Because, um, oh, I forgot to tell you because it felt so good to be in heaven. I could feel every molecule of my, of my being. And it was totally overflowing with a euphoria I had never known. And at the beginning of that thought, I felt better at the end. And I thought, how is this even possible that at the beginning of the thought was the best I'd ever felt. And I felt better by the end of that very short thought. And I just kept feeling better and better and better. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. So then being back here and still being sick, I was just, you know, and I knew, I knew that it was like a a lie that I, felt that way. And I knew it wasn't true. I knew God wasn't mad at me. Um, but it took me a long time to understand. And I, I still don't think I fully understand why I came back. I mean, to share my testimony for sure. Um, but then also for me to grow spiritually, cause you have to think when I was in heaven, I was a child, you know, Mm. I wasn't done growing. We're like little pop tarts. <laughs> <laughs> I like you know? that analogy. Yeah. We're li- like little pop tarts, and and you actually, when you were, um, you when you went in to uh, get blood tests done, mm-hmm. uh, the the poisoning was confirmed because your mercury levels were sky high. So. You had been poisoned all of this time. You talked about food being brought to you and and you're feeling sick after the food was delivered to you? Yeah, um, I had to get a hair follicle test to figure out what exactly was in my system because when I was going to the hospital, because I went to the hospital after I died and I woke up, <laughs> I went to the hospital and I'm like, I died and I'm, I want to know how I died. And they're like, you died. And I'm like, yeah, I went to heaven. I remember dying. And, um, they're like, well, it could be anything or like a series of things that somebody's could poison you with. And some of those things leave your body within 24 to 48 hours. And so unless we test for those things specifically, it's really hard to, you know, find out what's really going on with you. And I said, well, how do I find out then? He said, you need to go get a hair follicle test. So what I sent you guys was actually the results of my hair follicle test. And um, when they did it, they just took, because I have really long hair, they just took the three inches that were closest to my scalp to see what exactly that it was that was in my car that, you know, it killed me in the end, you know. But I just remember how good God is and what the Bible says. My children will eat and drink poison and not be harmed, you know. Subsequently Mm. after this, I know the Bible really well. I can't tell you like, uh, Corinthians chapter two, you know, verse five, I can't tell you that, but I can, I definitely know the word really, really well. It's very interesting how he literally tattooed it on my heart. It's quite nice, you know? Well, that's what uh, I think absolutely fascinating because, uh, somebody the other day, uh, Dana had asked, do we know anyone who has died, um, having been a, uh, a Catholic and we have had people coming from uh, Catholicism. We're not, we're not disparaging any of the denominational faiths, but in your uh, kind of upbringing, your belief at the time, uh, the early church, uh, the, of the Catholic Church, the priests interpreted the Bible uh, for the congregation. Um, yeah. that's not necessarily the case today in the modern uh, Catholic Church. But um, so you were you were not really exposed to the Bible necessarily, or at least it wasn't personal to you. And your experience Um, was very consumed with Jesus showing you the Bible. Well, I grew up in a Catholic church, but 
when I was saved and I, I was baptized, because you have to think that I, I didn't get sa- I didn't get saved until I was in my 20s, my late 20s. I was 22. And when I accepted Jesus as my personal savior, um, because I never found that relationship in a Catholic church. But I did speak to my Aunt Anita, who was a nun and obviously Catholic. So, but you have to go back to what the Bible says. One follows Peter, another follows Paul. We all follow Christ. So I listen a lot to um, Derek Prince. He's passed on now, but he's a Pentecostal preacher. And I also listen to Charles Stanley, and I believe he's Mm -hmm. Baptist. So as long as you're preaching the good word, I want to hear it. You know, I'm not, I, I just call myself a believer. That's what the Bible says to say. Just call yourself a believer. You know, yeah, and you saw, uh, didn't you? The your your aunt who was a, a nun in yeah. heaven. She had she had already passed away. Yeah, and you saw her uh, <laughs> in heaven. What did she look like? What did uh, now? Obviously, nuns dress in the uh, particular garb, <laughs> but uh, what did she look like uh, in heaven? That's what she looked like in heaven. The same. Oh. Get- she had the same getup on. It was that really light gray, silver blue color with white trim. Um, the other women in heaven that I saw, they all had their heads covered. That's legitimate. We're supposed to keep our heads covered. And they wore um, really long gowns, like their sleeves are covered or their arms are covered and their dresses go down to the floor. They're really, really pretty. Everybody looks so lovely in heaven. You yeah. know, it's beautiful. But yeah, I, I feel convicted about that. I, I believe I should definitely be keeping my head covered. You know, it's, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah. Well, now uh, we'll get back to uh, heaven here in a bit because you have a fascinating account. Uh, first meeting Abraham, who's the father and uh, father of uh, of Judaism, actually uh, beginning of the Bible, you know, Abraham uh, giving birth to uh, uh, as uh, God told him, the stars in the sky will be your offspring. Uh, and so we'll get back to Abraham and the other things and experiences you had with uh, with Jesus. But um, uh, you were apparently being poisoned. It was confirmed in the hospital that you had this high mercury level sure. and you had poison in, within your body. And ex- from what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, the mercury level was exponentially higher than than what it normally would be or should be at least you know if somebody eats fish or something like that um so you went back to that same environment where apparently you know you were being fed given food and uh-huh. you were actually be given you were given um some money weren't you to uh so there, it seems like you were being taken care of and i know yep. there's this uh syndrome called munchausen's uh, syndrome where a caregiver uh for whatever reason uh, the syndrome uh makes them want to poison the person for whom they're caring uh for yeah. that's what I later found out yeah exactly mm-hmm so you later found out that this was being done to you. You were being poisoned. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, but I'm so grateful. I mean, not that being poisoned, I wouldn't recommend that by any means. That was a very difficult time. But I also sent you a picture of my driver's license so you can see that really nothing has happened to me. God's completely restored me. I had PTSD for a while that I... um God delivered me from praise God. And, um, I've had tumors and they've wanted to give me a double mastectomy, but I won't allow it because I know nothing's going to happen. Like I I know that they're going to go away or they'll be malignant. I know that nothing bad is going to happen from that. And, um, if anything ever did happen to me, which it will eventually, because we all pass, I'm not concerned about it. It's all under Mm. God has control over everything. So his timing is perfect. And whenever I'm ready, he's going to bring me home. And I'm excited about that. I also wanted to share with people that um, what it's like to die. It does not hurt at all. Zero. There's no pain. The second I could not breathe here, it's faster than a second. I could breathe over there. There is no, it's death is not something anyone should fear as long as you believe in God. And, you know, you've given your life to Christ and you've confessed your sins and been baptized. Nope. It's 
it's lovely to be in heaven. So if any family members have passed, mm. be happy for them. Be happy. Yes. That's a, that's a paradigm shift, isn't it, uh, Dana? Because death is uh, rated as the number one fear uh, yeah. in, in many uh, polls. And so people fear death. But when you were at that point, you said that you had a particular feeling as you were, as your spirit was leaving your body. And I don't know if you had seen any part of that process of just, uh, of God releasing you of your uh, spirit. The Bible talks about being absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So that's in the Bible. Um, was there any sense while that was happening that, uh, uh, before you actually were brought to this place where, where you had seen the scroll and you had seen Abraham before you? No, that was really interesting for me as well, because when I watched other um, people share their testimony, they experienced things like going through a tunnel or seeing a bright light or things like that. And that definitely was not my experience. He, um, I was going through the earth and there were roots in the ground and he carried me over his shoulder. Like I said, he has a lamp in one hand and his staff in the other. And then he carried me up to this plateau where, you know, I was judged and then went to heaven, praise God. But yeah, it was all very interesting. I don't have total revelation on the entire thing. I got most of my understanding when I came back and read the Bible. That's given me the most understanding, but my questions were answered, um, that I needed to be confessing my sins and that the entire Bible was true, that we were in tribulations and that I was taking credit for the good works that God was doing in my life and that we can't work our way to heaven. That's not, it's a free gift. So those were the, the main highlights of my journey. And then after I would say my hardships were being back here just in general and understanding that because I wanted to be in heaven so badly and to be back with Jesus. And I didn't understand why I was here. Again, I'd heard other people, they have testimonies where it was quite clear their purpose back here. And I, what that wasn't revealed to me. Um, so I definitely knew that I needed to be sharing my testimony, but what else I was supposed to do with my life, I wasn't quite sure. And that, you know, that was a whole nother journey, but there are so many good things that came from that. For one, it's really humbling for t mm. and two. It kept me seeking the Lord, like, God, what am I supposed to do with this? Or how am I supposed to handle this? Or, you know, what is my purpose here? What would you like me to do? But those are all things that happen when you mature and grow in God. So, you know, I was just left with the understanding of, you know, we're like little Pop-Tarts. I wasn't done yet. You know, you just came up too soon and you had to, you know, put me back down here so I could finish growing, which is such an amazing gift. That is such an amazing gift to have uh, your soul really um be able to come down here and have this experience you know oh my gosh i forgot to share with you i totally forgot i don't know how i forgot it there was a guy in heaven and he had really big ears like huge ears and i said why are his ears so big and he said because he never listened and then even the guy started laughing and he had super sharp teeth and i said why are his teeth so sharp and he said because his words were very sharp so the things that we do here matter, even though we don't work our way to heaven, they definitely affect us for eternity. So I just thought that was so funny, God's sense of humor and just how, uh, yeah, how the things we do here matter. They really do. You know, they affect us. Wow. Was this person, when he was showing you this person, his, he didn't <laughs> listen. He had large ears. His teeth oh. <laughs> were sharpened because uh, he was speaking sharp you know, bitter yeah. words, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so do you think that person was uh, in heaven appearing this yeah. way? There was a visage uh, that, that Jesus was showing you um, that was, uh, obviously he was explaining to you uh, the secrets or mysteries of the afterlife. But was this person in heaven or do you think he was giving you kind of a visage of somebody who wasn't in heaven? No, he was definitely in heaven for sure. And he was stuck like that for eternity, you know? <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. yeah. So I was oh. like, oh, 
wow, I don't want to have really big ears. I definitely want to have nice teeth, you know? And, um, I believe he showed me that too, because my words were very sharp and I'm not always a good listener. I have to pray for those things for sure. Um, on the regular and, um, I don't know. After I came back, he was like really patient with me. I got frustrated with myself because I didn't have this huge faith. I thought, you know, God, I've died. I've been to heaven. I've seen you. I should be like moving mountains and delivering people from demons and just Mm. being the spiritual giant. And I was like, I'm still struggling with even why I'm here and wondering if you even love me. Oh God. It's just because I know he loves me, you know? And how could I struggle with something like that? That's so basic, you know? And I just thought, you know, like, I don't know what I thought. I just wanted, I just wanted to be like spiritually uh, mature. And I just wasn't, which was hard for me to understand. And, you know, that was difficult. Well, you know, all of us, uh, Dana, that have had an experience, and and many of us have had a variety of different experiences that the Lord reveals to us, specific to our own needs. Um, We come back, uh, some feeling overjoyed, some feeling like I went through a period of of depression because I thought, here I am back in this world, back in this body, I'm I'm sick uh, again, and, and all of these things. Mm-hmm. And uh, it took, uh, I would say, Dana, a period of an, several years. And, yes. uh, you know, from our interviews, uh, it seems like it takes at least a seven years or about a period of seven years. I studied this with some others yes. before uh, the person who's had the afterlife experience actually assimilates this and can begin to understand what it was about for them personally. Um so I wouldn't be disconcerted by, you know, that you're not speaking on the top of the mountain like uh, <laughs> Moses or Rachel or whatever uh, yet or, or will, because uh, you're doing that now. I mean, that's that's what you're doing now. You're speaking to us. And right. so you're ministering the grace of God. You may not be feeling like it. You've gone through, uh, you know, some maladies physiologically. Uh, and psychologically that that are probably because you're in your body, you're at the effect of you've had, you know, this uh, situation with the tumors uh, diagnosis there and hopefully following the guidance of your physicians to a large extent in in uh, in, in resolving that if, you know, to whatever extent is possible. And you're believing in a in a, in a miracle, which is great. Um, yeah. But all of these things come into play. We're back in our bodies. We're back in our in our head, you know, <laughs> we're not released. Cause I, I'll ask you this, when you were in heaven with Jesus, did you feel any of these things? Did you feel any <laughs> sorrow, anything of that sort? No, zero, absolutely zero. Um, which is really interesting because I, I had complete trust in God when I passed that he was taking care of everything. And I can't even take credit for that. It's just a peace that he gives you. It's an understanding that he gives you. It's just another gift that's waiting for you there. And um, yeah, no, not for my pet. I have a dog. Yeah, I wasn't concerned about her at all. And it's not that I didn't care about her. I just knew that he was going to take care of everything. And I didn't feel any sort of pain at all when I was there. It was just the opposite. It was euphoria on a level I'd never known. And I was like, wow, this is amazing, which is why I wanted to stay there. I didn't want to come back here and struggle and be sick and um, have to go through the emotional healing that I, you know, was facing. That that was a steep mountain to climb. And I I don't really like hiking. <laughs> and God talked to me about that, too. You know, I was like, God, I don't like hiking. And he's like, but Dana, it's a lot easier if you have a better attitude, you know? And I was just like, oh, all right, I'll I'll try to muster up a better attitude, you know? But now that some time has passed, you talked about seven years, you know, which is very significant. And I was just reading the other day about Nebuchadnezzar and how um, he was in the wilderness for seven years until he could admit that... um, the Lord was that God was Lord over everything. And he didn't have to explain himself to anyone. And Job had a very similar experience. And that's pretty much what I came to the conclusion to was that God didn't have to explain himself to me, 
that I was eternally grateful for all the things that he had done in my life. And I was looking forward to the greater things that would happen uh, later on in my life, because it says that he will finish the good work that he started in you. So, you know, he just wasn't finished yet. And um, when you think about relationships, you know, because it's really about our relationship with God, relationships aren't, um, how do I put this? Relationships are never going to be perfect. And it's not through those good times that we develop character or trust for the other person. It's when we weather the storms with that person and we see that they're not going to leave us. That's when we really develop character, trust, faith, hope. The, the, those are the, the fruits that come from that. And um, looking for an ideal relationship or something that's perfect, quote unquote, that's, that's not that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that there's going to be hardships. There's going to be struggles. I mean, look at Paul, for example, and what he went through shipwrecked left, you know, hungry mm. yes. and, um, all, all kinds of things. I, and Paul still had the thorn in his side and he said, my grace is sufficient, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, I'm really encouraged by all the all the uh, the books in the Bible and seeing all the hardships, even David, you know, losing a son. That's that I can't even imagine that, you know, um, he gave me that God gave me this great analogy about baseball. Cause I was like crying out to him and I was really struggling with my walk and God's like, Dana, what's up with baseball? Cause I play sports a lot. And he's, mm-hmm. and I was like, baseball, you want to talk about baseball right now? I'm like, crying my eye I'm, I'm my heart out just pouring it out to you and you want to talk about baseball I was like okay let's talk about baseball sure why not and he gave me this image of a ball with red stitching keep in mind the blood of Christ and I said you you're the rock the ball and he said okay and then he gives me this image of a bat in my mind and I thought would bat the cross would the cross and he's like okay and he's like what do you do when you're up at bat and I go well I hope I hit the ball and it goes way out to outfield and he's all well who catches it out there well all I could think of is that movie angels in the outfield so that's what I said and he's like okay angels in the outfield then what do you do and I and then I got it all of a sudden I got it the revelation just came to me and I was like I run on the straight white line and he's all how many bases are there I said three father son holy spirit to get to home baby he's all who's in your dugout and I was like, who's in my dugout? The 12 disciples. They're on my team. They're in my dugout. And he's wow. like, all right, he's in the crowd. And I was like, the crowd, the crowd, the non-believers and the believers yet to come. And he was like, all right, who's the judge? Are you the judge? And I was like, the judge. No, I'm not the judge. Who's the judge? That's the ump. That's Adunai. He wears black and white. And he's like, okay. And he's all, what about the field? Is that field level out there? And I go, yes, we're all equal, except for you. You're the pitcher. We raise you up. And he was like, okay. <laughs> that you know? is great. Wow. Yeah. I love how he, you know, uh, people who are watching or listening to this, um, a lot of them are just very open-minded about these experiences. And thank God for that. Uh, because the bizarreness of them may seem strange to us because we don't relate uh to some of these things we haven't seen these some of these things <laughs> yeah, but i love the fact that was a was perfect how jesus knew precisely yeah. how to reach you he took oh, your yeah. own experience and he used the analogy of baseball i'm a baseball fan as well he used oh, the yeah. analogy of baseball now to go through and help to explain to you the different mm-hmm. parts of God and the different part of his creation and people and, and, uh, the judge and so on and so forth. I think it's absolutely mm-hmm. incredible, but that he, he loved you, loves you so much that he would, uh, define something in the context of something that you enjoy. Oh yeah. And you have to think like the shape isn't a diamond, the shape of the field. Cause we're, he's making us all hard pressed diamonds. You know what I mean? I mean the whole analogy, you pray before the game, you know, and um, the wave, you lift your hands up, you know, you praise God. We're always winning. If we hold our hands up, think about Moses, you know, he was always winning the battle as long as he kept his hands raised. So it's definitely, yeah. it's like a game to have a good attitude, you know? And he talked to me about the players, like who are the best players? The players that list them a lot who are re- really encouraging. Those are the best players, you know? Uh, you know? So and he's 
totally. And he's given me other analogies too. And honestly, God's in everything. So whatever you're into, whatever your interests are, if you just start having conversations with him, he's going to reveal himself to you. I mean, he's given me more along the way. Like it's probably another conversation, but you know, he's definitely giving me more um, analogies and things to help me encourage me and to cur- encourage other people. And they're always really simple. There are always things that you could tell a child that it's nothing super complex. It's nothing really heavy. It's just, you know, comes back to exactly what the Bible says. Love, love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your might and your neighbor as yourself. Mm. You know, everything hangs on that. Yeah. So true, Dana. You know, uh, with some of our guests, I will be uh, praying because I'll hear something and I think, whoa, Lord, why are you, why are you showing this? Why is this uh, revealed to so-and-so this way? And there are some unique aspects to your story that are unique to you and how God wanted to reveal himself and, and some truths to you. He obviously, the Bible was integral. You were seeing it from from Genesis to Revelation, and he was revealing that, and uh, the, the, the worm, the, the poisoning, the apple we know in the garden um, was poisoned the spirit, uh, their spirit, uh, because they had partaken of something in offense to what God told them not to do, and at the same time, you uh, were poisoned, um, by something that, that you were ingesting, which caused you, uh, to lose your life. And you said that something also, which is very, uh, unique. And so I'm praying, okay, Lord, what, what's, what's the uh, meaning behind that? Uh, many talk about a, a light being the most common, a tunnel being the most common reference to a, a near death or afterlife experience. Um, and I was pulled by the light. I didn't experience at the time, my time, a, a tunnel necessarily, but the, I guess the light streaming down would be like a tunnel. Uh, but in your case, you went through the ground, uh, yeah. you went through the ground and that's unique. And I'm thinking, Lord, what is this? What is about, can I ask Dana about in terms of the ground? And I'm thinking that Dana was being birthed anew was being birthed anew, her faith, her life was being birthed anew, and you were showing her the birthing through through the ground from ashes to ashes. Many of us are either, uh, depending on how people take care of our, our bodies, which are gone at the time uh, we enter into uh, to heaven, or uh, pray not the other place, and from dust to dust. And I'm thinking, you know, either being lowered into the ground or going back to the ground as dust, we all go back to the ground, not spiritually speaking, our bodies who are wasted away in this place. And he was showing you how even in the waste, uh, that not the waste, but even in, in unearthing, let's say, yeah, your, your soul being revived in the Bible, the word giving life. Uh, to you and imparting that life to you. I think it's fascinating how the God, God was revealing this to you. And then you went back to the, the baseball diamond and the path mm-hmm. and the, and the yeah. ground there and all of these things. It's like, it's like, and, and, uh, and he's showing you, uh, Ab- Abraham and he's showing you these things, the gold path that you talked about. All of these things are kind of foundational aspects of where we live and then where we thrive in heaven. And he's laying the foundation for you through the word of God, through the Bible. I think it's absolutely, uh, wondrous. Um, <laughs> A lot of people ask about, they're curious, okay, what, what does Jesus look like? Uh, Moses, you're the, I think the second or third person who actually saw some of the uh, people in the Bible. Um, we had Alicia, uh, saw Moses and she saw Elijah and she saw Noah in, uh, from the Bible in heaven. When she went to heaven, she died in childbirth. And uh, so can you kind of, when you met Abraham and you had this scroll, it was being poured out in front of you, uh, did you have a sense of what that scroll was like? And what, how about Abraham? He was a, he's a dude that, uh, you know, we, we know about, uh, but we, what did he look like? Um, I just remember he had a long, long, dark beard and he did not mess around. Like, um, he is so committed 
to serving the Lord that now when I read the story about him um, going to sacrifice his son, I know exactly how that went down. When the angel came and said, I want you to sacrifice your son, he didn't question it. He didn't ponder over it. He said, son, put some wood on the donkey. We're going for a walk. That's how that went. I mean, his commitment to the Lord is unshakable, unshakable. And that that's really what I was left with was his character. And um, I was just in awe of how steadfast and dedicated he was to the Lord. It was absolutely amazing. As far as what Jesus looks like, Yeshua, he has tan skin and green eyes and dark hair. I could see how some people would say dark brown or black. And um, it's about shoulder length straight, but uh, his eyes and his smile are so lovely. I would describe it like when he looks at you, he knows everything about you and um, he pulls out all the good and then all your sin falls away. It's very interesting. He's so loving. He's absolutely amazing. Like the most amazing person ever. He's, he's fantastic, yes. but he's definitely not white with blonde hair and blue eyes, which is what I grew up seeing in the Catholic church. So, um, <laughs> when people, yeah, when people are like, oh, that's, uh, cause I've shared my testimony and people are like, oh, that sounds like something that would happen on DMT. I'm like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> that's not the picture that I grew up seeing. First of all, secondly, everything that happened was quite linear and third it's all talked about in the bible and things were revealed to me that were so far beyond my understanding yet so simple at the same time i can't take credit for any of that and i don't you know so um yeah it was definitely not that that it just seems so preposterous to me when people say that oh when you die it's a dmt thing it's definitely not it's more real to be in heaven than it is here and that's another very common. I felt the same way. I tell people about that. It's more real in heaven than it is here. And they say, what do you mean? I mean, and and it is. Uh, we have more senses in heaven. We, yes. uh, we come alive in places that we were dead on earth. I know there are places we have dead spaces, uh, if you will, on earth where, you know, we're just uh, either our soul is dead into things. We don't smell the roses and all of those things. And it's exponentially more so in heaven. Um, so Abraham is there going back to Abraham. I think it's fascinating that he reveals Abraham to you because he is, uh, uh, the, the so-called father of the Jews. He's, yes. I love the story. I just recently did a teaching on, uh, the story of Abraham and being called to sacrifice his son, Isaac, and how that modeled or mirrored what God would do in as a sacrifice of his only begotten son, Jesus, who was the Emmanuel God with us. Um, but Abraham, so Abraham is, is, is showing this to you. And what another fascination is, so the Bible, which was the core of Abraham and all of those greats, uh, from Abraham to, to, to Paul and John, who authored the book of revelation under the inspiration of the Holy spirit. So he shows you the kind of the classic Bible, old Testament figure, Abraham, mm -hmm. you can't get much higher than that. And then he shows you this um, cherubim. This is an angel. Who, yeah. uh, and the angel is, is kind of, I guess, throwing out this scroll. What do you think that scroll was? Was that, how did that, how, what did that mean to you? The cherubim was like the size of a hummingbird. It was really small. And the scroll was all the things I had ever said. They're all documented in heaven. All, everything we've ever said. It's written down. That's legit. Yeah. Mm. And I was shocked at that because yeah. I thought, really? Everything? Yep. Everything. It's all written down. So that's why the Bible warns us about idle words. I mm. mean, the entire Bible is true and it's all relevant and it's all important. Basic instructions before leaving earth. I love that anagram. I believe it's true. And, uh, yeah, just the whole um, the whole Bible is true, and when I read it, I'm I still reminded of principles and things that I need to be paying attention to, and things are still revealed to me, which is so beautiful. It's not like I saw the Bible and I had complete understanding and revelation on every single topic. There were still things that 
you know, I wondered about, um, but I mean, the Bible explains itself perfectly. Like, for example, do not talk about who will go to heaven and who will go to hell. People have asked me about the tribulation and when Jesus is coming and it says no man knows the the day or the hour. So it's like the Bible explains right. itself right there. I mean, it answers your questions. I just think people are wrestling with it. And, you know, just because you're wrestling with it doesn't go. God doesn't have to explain himself to you. So having that blind faith and believing and um, being excited for his coming, you know, for his return is where we should really be at and being um, singing songs of praise. Because you have to think, you know, we enter we enter the temple courts with praise and thanksgiving and it says the singers will go in first. So, you know, those are all key things that we should be doing to prepare ourselves you know, to make sure we're wise brides and, you know, that we're prepared, that we have enough oil. That's yeah. very important right now. Yeah. And isn't it, isn't it kind of sad that God records our words? He's so loving and honoring to us that he's interested in every single word we speak, Everything. that he would record it. And yet we ignore his word oftentimes, you know, but he spoke uh, isn't that isn't that a the the most striking irony that he's interested in our words more oftentimes more than we're interested in his? I just think that shows God's love and His love for us that He values us that much that He cares for us that much that He would take the time to write everything that we say down yeah. and that all the things that we do in secret, you know, He sees those things. All the prayers that we ask for. You know, he hears them. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, that's what I walk away with it. And that it's truly our relationship with him is so intimate and so personal. And that he is paying such close attention to us. And that we're, tra we're his treasures here on earth. He died for us. You know, it's very romantic. He's a very romantic guy keeping all of our love letters. I like I like that. He yeah. is uh, romantic in the truest and and uh, purest sense of uh, yeah. of that word. Um, the, uh, the we'll we'll um, close here in a bit, uh, Dana. But the path in which you walk—that's another similar uh, explanation of heaven. Uh, and that is was a golden path there. And mm -hmm. can you explain a little bit of that? Was it like uh, like a slab of gold or is it bricks? Yeah, it was bricks, like handmade bricks, not like something you'd see in a movie, you know, when they have these manufactured bricks of gold that are all perfect. And uh, no, it wasn't like that. They were like handmade bricks of gold. There is lovely. Those are the streets of heaven. And the Bible talks about that. It's really pretty. It's mm. very pretty, you know. What struck you the most about heaven and being with Jesus? What was like, if you were to name maybe one or two uh, parts of your experience that meant the most to you? Um, it, well, it was all amazing. Uh, that, I mean, and it was all extremely relevant. Every single point, it was like nothing was wasted there. No time was wasted. Every single thing that he showed me was so important like for example the euphoria in heaven that's really kept me um like a something to look forward to like hey this is waiting for you here even though you're struggling right now even though it's hard right now even though you don't feel that great right now just know this is waiting for you hang on you know keep fighting the good fight and that you know his redemption his grace you know confession so if you don't feel that hot if your game's not so good you just choke up on the bat you know, I asked somebody that before. What happens if you had a really good game and you don't right now? What happens then? Mm -hmm. Because you just choke up on the bat. You bump the, you bump the ball. And I thought, oh, my gosh, you're brilliant. Choke up. You confess. You cry out. Oh, it's brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. You know? And, I love uh, that. Yeah, base, yeah. It said that baseball is a game of, uh, what is the, oh, my goodness. Now I forgot. Um, it's it's a game of, of, uh, of, of, so that where you lose more than you win in other words a good average is about uh you know 270 to 300 that's a good average a really good average 
certainly in the majors, but that that means that most of the time that people have that have gotten out, you know, the vast majority. And so we fail uh, so often in this life that but he forgives us of our sins if we confess our sins. Uh, yeah. 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 You have to think of like Babe Ruth stats. I think that like, and I don't want to misquote him, but from what I remember, he had the most home runs. It was just beaten recently. What like Derek Jeter or somebody? But anyways, for a long time, he held the record for the most home runs. Barry but Bonds, also, yeah, Barry yeah. Bonds, and then Hank Aaron before that broke the record. And... Yeah, but you have to think how how high was his strikeout record? He had like I think his stats for that were phenomenal. Like he struck struck out more than the majority of the players as well. So um, we just have to wait for those good pitches you know, wait for God to open up the door for those opportunities and to know that, you know, nothing returns to God null and void. So even though we might think that we struck out, you don't know how that's going to play out. You know, you don't know how that's going to affect somebody down the road, or you don't know if that person is going to go and share that testimony with somebody else. I think, I, I don't even know if this is true, but somebody told me that Billy Graham, the person who witnessed to Billy Graham, that was the only person they ever brought to Christ was Billy Graham. But look how many people Billy Graham brought to, brought to Christ, you know? So it's like, uh, that's always encouraging to think about things like that, that you just don't know. Uh, you don't know the impact that you're having on people. Yeah. I mean, you have to feel that way about the ministry that you're doing right now because you're reaching so many people that might not, comment or might not say anything or maybe that you never hear from that come to Christ because of what you're doing, you know? Yeah. We, um, and I, and that goes for each of us, uh, what you're doing now through your sharing Dana, but in the moments of life we had, before we started uh, taping, there was a homeless man that came to uh, Dana's door and I known that he was homeless. What was going on there? I thought, Oh my goodness. And she, <laughs> she opened the door <laughs> and yeah. said, no, you know, I'm, I'm busy now, uh, something to that effect. And, uh, anyway, and I was thinking about that, um, that a, it could have been an interruption that the enemy thought, Oh, I'm going to, you know, really interfere with this thing. And, uh, or B, uh, and from God's perspective, certainly, well, here's an opportunity to, to pray for this guy that he come to know Christ and, and that he not uh, be, have to knock on or doesn't have to knock on windows or kind of frighten people at times, but that he can actually, uh, you know, live a life that's fruitful and know Christ and and uh, share, whether it be on the job or whether it be, you know, praying for somebody. God gives a word. Uh, he does this to me often. That's one of my takeaways from heaven. As he said, in the moments of your life, not in the not in the grandiose scheme of things, but in the moments of our life, we need to look for those opportunities to fulfill God's purpose for us. So now I find myself uh, saying, okay, well, I see this person over here at the grocery store and uh, God brings to mind something that about this special. And I said, well, what, what do you want me to do? Uh, do you want me to pray for this person? Do you want me to approach them? And I have all of these vignettes now of stories of, uh, of things, occasions that God has put forth where before heaven, I would not see these things. I would just, you know, I kind of li I would live life casually. Um, and now it's intentional. So how has, uh, this is my last question for you, Dana, before we, uh, do what I consider to be, um, the most important part of these interviews. What, it, what it was, what changed you the most? Let's, I'll put it that way in your heaven experience to how you live life now. Oh, man, that's a good question. Because before I died, I was really seeking the Lord because I was sick. So I was doing everything I could possibly think to do to seek the Lord. I mean, reading the word, uh, fasting, praying, not being on any sort of like internet at all, like not watching TV, not watching movies. I mean, anything that would come to mind, I would just and I did, I got closer and closer to God. And I, after I came, came back, I was definitely still struggled with sin. I like, wasn't this perfect person and I wanted to be a perfect person, but that's never going to happen. 
you know, which was, I was disappointed in myself. Um, I think that we all have different ministries and gifts, um, for sure. After, after I came back, um, I didn't have any resources. I didn't have any money saved up. The person that was supporting me before I could no longer have contact with. So I was literally like a homeless person, literally like a homeless person. I was by the grace of God, um, that I survived. I remember that I just basically stayed with a friend, um, one after the other, you know, and I was, not, I was like a special needs person when I came back. I wasn't in good health. I, I cried a lot for like mm. three months, basically. I just cried. And I remember I got a job and I remember telling myself, don't talk to anybody. Just go to work and do your best. But don't talk to anybody. Don't tell anybody what happened. Um, Cause I was afraid they'd fire me and then I wouldn't have any money. So um I have a real heart for homeless people. That's why you saw the guy outside my door. He hit me up for a couple bucks, which I'm more than happy to give him a couple bucks. Uh, because you have to think like, that's a whole, that's a whole nother. That's, I just have a heart for people who are struggling um, because for well, multiple reasons. But I feel like people have unreal expectations about people who are homeless in general. I live in Southern California. So there's quite a few people that camp out here because the weather's so great. And, um, they think, oh, don't give them money. They're just going to go buy drugs. Who cares? Who cares? That's not the point. The guy outside asked me for a specific amount and I happened to have it and, um, I gave it to him and I was just thinking what a great way to start off this video. You know what I mean? Just Mm by, um, being able to be a blessing to this guy. And what was actually happening was he was blessing me. I don't know if people realize that. But when you give to somebody else, you're, they're really giving you the opportunity to uh, serve the Lord. So they're really being a blessing to you. And the other thing is, is that you don't always have to give money to people who are down and out. You can say, you know, like you can pray for them or ask them what they need. Like, what do you need? That's a very good question to ask. They'll usually say something that's very simple, like socks, for example, or um, I don't know, like a meal, but they want to see that you've bought it because people poison, ironically, poison homeless people a lot. They consider them to be rats on the street. And so now you have somebody that could have just been down on their luck or made a series of bad decisions. We all have you know, and, um, now they're poisoned and how are they going to overcome that? How are they going to trust anybody again? How are they going to get a job? How are they going to get back on their feet? And, you know, not everybody does, but that's not the point. The point is, is that we do what God's called us to do without judgment. You know, we all fall short of the glory of God and praise God that you've never been in a situation where you have faced being homeless or literally living off of the kindness of strangers or digging through trash cans. I've never been there. Thank God. But, um, my heart definitely goes out to people who are for sure. Um, and then I think of how many people were homeless in the Bible. Jesus was homeless. It says foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of God has no place to lie his head. You know, when Moses went out into the desert after he killed that guy, so he literally murdered someone and then ran out to the desert. There was no home waiting for him. When John was out living in the desert, eating locusts and wild honey, I can't imagine that he was out there with a home. He was probably homeless out there. The 12 disciples following Jesus, they must have been homeless. You know, I I could go on about it. And I've never even read the Bible looking for that. But just as I like recall people, I mean... Let's take Paul, for example. Paul was shipwrecked how many times and imprisoned? And it says that he wrote people to ask them for a place to stay. Please prepare a guest house for me. So he must have been homeless. So you have these people who were literally changing and influencing history and souls, literally your soul, which is priceless. And they were homeless. Mm. So... I mean, really how we view homeless people, um, I pray it's with compassion and kindness without judgment because you never know what's happened to somebody. You don't know how they got out there. 
what if literally they were fleeing for their lives like I was? I was literally fleeing for my life. I left. I had no car, no money, no place to stay. And you have to think 24 hours prior to that, I had um, a nice income. I had a nice car. I had a nice apartment, you know, so I literally walked away from all of that to save my life. And um, now, praise God, I have my own car. I have a great job. Um, I'm doing quite well. But it took me a minute to get there. It, it didn't yeah. happen overnight, you know. Yeah. Such a great insight. And uh, I think for us, especially today, when the homelessness is rampant and oh, so yeah. many people are just without, so many people are having financial difficulties and struggles today. So we really need, for those who can be generous, uh, I'm not soliciting here. I'm, t I'm asking for anyone who, who, who needs whatever. I think now is the time, especially for those who have the wherewithal to give, to give, as you said, freely our best Christmas uh, within our family is when we went on Christmas Day to uh, downtown San Francisco on Union Square and just had a massive number of uh, homeless people. And we were having church, uh, you know, preaching and healing and all kinds of things uh, for these homeless people. So now, uh, Dana, we have the opportunity I'm going to give to you if you feel comfortable. Uh, if not, I'll... Uh, I'll I'll do this, but uh, this is a very important one. Don't leave, because this is a time when your life truly will be changed spiritually. And for some of you, this will be the first time that that you come to know the one who loves you most. Mm -hmm. You never knew that. You thought you thought there was no love, or you thought this person failed you, or this person was your greatest love. And no, the one who loves you most is Jesus. So. Dana, for those who do not know Jesus or feel abandoned by God, will you pray for them right now? Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to come together in prayer. I love some praise and worship. Worship. All right, That's let's do it. Let's do it. That's so good. Heavenly Father, Jesus, we come before you in praise, Lord, and 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 thanksgiving as we walk into the temple courts and we ask that you open up the hearts and the minds of those who hear this testimony and all the testimony that you have your servants out here working in the fields um that it spreads like wildfire and that people receive it receive it with gifts of healing with deliverance with prosperity with love with kindness lord father that you reveal yourself to them, your character, your desires for our lives, Lord, and that your love is eternal. And um, when we do confess, Lord, you say that our sin is remembered no more. You cast it as far as it is from the east as from the west. So forgive us of our sin, that which is known and unknown to us, Lord. Continue to be patient with us. Finish the good work that you started in us, Lord. Help us to discern what we are to do, when we are to do it, and how we are to do it. And may we do all things with love and kindness. In the name of Jesus, I praise your name. Amen. Amen. Great prayer. Oh, thanks. He's good. Yeah. He's like, Thank you. Thank and if, if you have uh, prayed for the first time, or maybe you're renewing your vow to uh, to the Lord, uh, if you prayed, confess your, you know, that I need you, Lord. I've sinned, fallen short. You know, I accept your uh, your g gift that you gave me when you sacrificed yourself on the cross, and I want you to become Lord of my life for the rest of my days and eternity. Then uh, please uh, contact us at randyk.org. Uh, let us know if you have any concerns or otherwise or comments. Uh, you can go to randyk.org, the contact page. Uh, but especially if you did uh, receive Jesus as your Lord, uh, this is a special time. We want to kind of help you through that process, maybe help you get plugged into a, a body, whether it be a small group or, you know, believers church. Uh, so that's important to, to nurture that faith, nurture that walk, because this is a hard world world. We know that, don't we, Dana? Yes. And we can't give up on each other. He really yeah. showed me that because I had some issues when I was like going back to church I was like all oh, y'all are sinners over here and he's like Dana you're still a sinner and I'm like oh I know and he's all so just keep showing up and praying for yourself and praying for other people you know what I mean? yeah because yeah. I I was like 
No, I just wanted to be influenced by people who were um, really going to, like, I thought, challenge me and be, like, very spiritual. And he was like, Dana, what what do you think this looks like? Those people are very spiritual and they, they are running the good race and they're having a hard time just like you are. And it's one body. <laughs> yeah. We're all in this together. This is, this is not home. This is not home. This no. world is not, home. it's a workstation. So yes. we have work to do. So, uh, go forth and, uh, and spread the good news, pray for people. And, uh, maybe there'll be a homeless person coming your door uh, to your door. Like, uh, uh, there was, uh, uh, before this interview started and, uh, and Dana was able to give him a couple bucks and, you know, pray for somebody at the grocery store, um, wow. say a kind word and all of those good things. So thank you so much, Dana, for joining us today. Thank and a you. Great blessing. And now, You're for a blessing. The, well, thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for watching and listening to this. So now uh, the great news is this. If you are in Christ Jesus, be of good cheer because heaven is in your future. Take care and God bless. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.